change is all about human relationships, collaboration and trust building between people. So you can, you can park all the digital tools to the side and, and that's the first thing you have to focus in on is how do we create connections between people, relationships and trust and how do we then begin to collaborate at, at a global scale? I think that's the first and most important uh, challenge we have to overcome if we're ever gonna solve the SDGs. David Jensen is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. David is coordinator of the UNEP Digital Transformation Task Force and Program at the UN Environmental Program and a champion of the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability, or acronym CODES. He is also the head of the Environmental Peacebuilding Program at the UN Environment and has been involved with the United Nations for going on over 21 years now. He has done fabulous things around the world and has been a lead leader in global efforts to establish a new multidisciplinary field of environmental peace building and many, many more things over his long time. He's had a TED Talk that's got numerous views, a couple of TED Talks and is also a founding board member of the Environmental Peace Building Association. David, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Mark. It's a real pleasure to be here. I, I'm glad you let me kind of shorten your, your bio because you've been doing this for a while and I could really go on about how you've uh, kind of started out on this journey and, and, and ha it has developed over the years. One thing I, I left off is that you're part of the United Nations Sustainable Development Solutions Network and the SDG Academy and have a wonderful MOOC course there um, that is very successful, has been watched uh, quite a, a, a bunch of times, and it's also a lot, has the uh, highest enrollments. And we kind of got to know each other through the Resilience Frontiers program in Bonn, and that's where we first met live and had some exchanges before that time. You're also kind of an alumni founding driver of Resilience Frontiers, which is still kind of in the metamorphosis process of, of how it's going, you know, as a, as, a, as a future of emerging technologies, pioneering technologies, and how that really gets involved in and where we're going after 2030 to 2050 and, and and how does that resilience look like that we need to build and then we've worked on many different things in collaboration you're really spearhead you're a connector a maker a doer in many respects during the pandemic you did the earth school which was with tedx and and many other organizations uh, or not TEDx, TED Education uh, program, which is really these quests for, for kids and, uh, who were at home. They were kind of being educated by their parents. And, and I, I mean, I could go on and flagship papers and discussions that you've done, but that's kind of how we met. And uh, I, I really have been stalking you, so to say. I've been watching <laughs> what you do, listen to your talks. We just, uh, I, I believe, both went through the digital summer school, the digital uh, for our planet uh, summer school through Connect University and the European Union. And you're involved in so many things. And most people, and I am as well, but most people would say, boy, Mark's all over the place and, and he's doing this and this. I think you take this very digital and systems view of life. And in order to solve our global grand challenges, I think you'd like to be on all these transformations because you know it's not a linear or siloed approach to solving them, that you're kind of involved in all these things because they have to tie to the bigger picture. I may be wrong, but that leads me to my first question for you is really, how have you weathered this crazy time, the pandemic, Black Lives Matters, Asian racism, the inauguration, climate change and all these things that have gone on since the beginning of 2020, 15, going on 18 months now. And all that experience you had before, were they learning lessons for better operating 
systems or ways of living that have helped you and your family weather the storm? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, uh, as you said, most people during the pandemic, you know, we were locked down in our homes. I've got four kids and I really tried to use it as kind of an opportunity to be the parent I had never been before. Right. So I had the chance on a daily basis to sit with my kids and sort of provide them the kind of environmental education I had hoped they were getting in school, but wasn't entirely certain if they were. And it certainly wasn't coming through me. Right. And so this was for me a phenomenal opportunity to sit down and really take them through kind of an environmental education journey. And we, we were discovering at the time we were using whatever materials I could find. So a lot of it was Bill Nye, uh, the science guy. We were pulling in some materials from WWF. We were pulling in National Geographic. And we would sort of watch, watch the material and then go out and try to apply it in practice, right? We'd go to the local forest and, and collect plants and try to grow them or you know, whatever it was, we were trying to do some kind of experiment. And that's kind of the, that was the first sort of survival <laughs> mechanism was, it wasn't really survival, it was more exploration of, of you know, how I can teach my kids about environmental issues in a really practical way and, and use that as kind of the basis for uh, weathering the storm, as you said. And it, it kind of occurred to me that if, if we're doing this in, in my family, there are other families doing exactly the same thing. And there are other professionals that uh, you know, are doing the same thing. And why don't we connect and collaborate and build this platform called Earth School so that we could really offer something a bit more professional uh, to the kids uh, during COVID. Uh, so we brought together about 70 volunteers uh, from around the world and we created this uh, this six, week, um, this six week challenge where every, every day there would be a video and then there would be a, a set of curated lessons and, and tasks. And the whole idea was really just give the kids uh, some really top quality environmental education, some, some lessons and, and to use that as, as a way for their, you know, maintaining connection to nature and also sort of as a mental health management tool, right? We've really felt lockdown was so difficult mentally that, that nature was an opportunity to really kind of manage that mental health, get back out and to kind of experience, you know, the wonder and, and beauty of nature. So it was both an activity as well as kind of a, a mental health management uh, tool. And, and I mean, with, with all the, the 21 plus going on 21 plus years now with the UN and, and the things you've done and, and, the Middle East and then the Balkans and, and many other places around the world. Um, you, you've seen a lot of things, but you've seen different operating manuals. You've seen siloed approaches. You've seen other approaches and, and what works, what doesn't work. And you've also said you, you, in your TED talk, you know, you said that the United Nations is a united type of a thing. And we've seen since Antonio Guterres has come in a big discussion about reformation of the entire UN and coming together and systems and kind of how, how can we work more effectively and better. But specifically with, with what you experienced during these crazy times, which they were crazy before, but now we were dealt with working for more and more digital technologies, you know, the Zoom and Skype calls and, 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 and this really need for more advanced home offices, digital solutions and things um, that you'd been working on before. A matter of fact, there was this wonderful uh, project and it's, I believe it's still going on. I don't, project's not the right term, transformation, digital ecosystem for the earth and things that you've been involved. There are some papers that have come out and how it can get us on, on the right path. Were there any other learning lessons, aha moments where you're saying, boy, We've, we've heard the talk about the digital transformation, but we're just not 100% there yet, or we're in the process, or had we had done this, it, boy, it would have put us in a better place at now. I mean, what were some of the learning lessons and some even more journeys that maybe were enlightened during this time where you can say, boy, uh, uh, these are better models that really helped progress this time, or it brought more people to the table asking questions where are these solutions and where do we need to go? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the first lesson would just be if we park digital to the side for a moment and, and just ask, you know, how do we be effective in progressing global change? Fundamentally, we have to invest in human relationships. Number one, most important thing, change is all about human relationships, collaboration and trust building between people. 
So you can, you can park all the digital tools to the side. And, and that's the first thing you have to focus in on is how do we create connections between people, relationships and trust? And how do we then begin to collaborate at, at a global scale? I think that's the first and most important uh, challenge we have to overcome if we're ever gonna solve the SDGs is that human relationship, trust building and collaboration at scale issue. Now, I think digital technologies can really help um, with that issue. I mean, that's and that's what the lockdown taught me anyway. And, you know, when we started locking down, um, MS Teams was just coming online and it, it turned out to be, you know, a survival mechanism for collaboration across UNAP. And it turned out that I became more connected with my colleagues through MS Teams than I had ever been before because of that digital backbone we had and because of the ease of using all the tools inside Teams and the, and the cloud collaboration and everything else, I actually built uh, many more relationships during, during COVID than I ever had prior, previous uh, to it. And that was underpinned by MS Teams and Zoom and all these, all these technologies. So I really found in terms of collaboration that uh, it, it was fundamental and, it, and, it, and it, you can build good relationships and you can build trust through, through, through digital tools and techniques. I think, the, I think the challenge right now is you've got all these pockets of innovation happening and, and all of this explosion of digital technology for the environment. And what's not really happening is that a lot of these are kind of siloed still and we're not kind of building this ecosystem of, of projects and we're not yet figuring out how to digitally connect all these initiatives so they're kind of interoperable and synergistic. And I think that's that's the next big challenge. So we need to start connecting these these pilots, connecting uh, the different projects, and really then build relationships across the people who are involved in each of them. And I think uh, you know that remains the the biggest single challenge is that you know solving climate change, achieving the SDGs, is all about collaboration at a global scale. And that's kind of the lesson that that COVID also taught us is that we're not quite there yet, right? like achieving global collaboration for us, uh, for an existential risk is still difficult. And we and social media and digital technology are also part of the problem. They kind of undermine that collaboration, especially through the propagation of fake news and misinformation. So if we're gonna achieve the SDGs and we're gonna achieve climate change um, using digital tools, we also have to look at that, at that downside, right? We have to be uh, managing and preventing the amplification of misinformation and fake news because that fundamentally divides us and prevents that kind of global scale collaboration that we're going to have to achieve. The the pause, for, and I, I can't speak for you, but the pause for me, the the COVID, the the, the time not traveling, and, and that was probably the most effective I've ever been in my life to some extent. Um, Instead of eating more, or watching more TV or stuff, I, I doubled down on books and on uh, courses and really made, setting apart on, on what knowledge did I need to learn about um, the tools, the UN, about uh, systems that are out there, how those systems work and things. And during this time, I've seen you, you're everywhere. You're just involved in so many things because digital is everywhere and it's not it hasn't come together as this ecosystem yet. They're these siloed or individual players all doing fabulous, amazing things. They're not really speaking or collaborating together. Or there's not a spot, one single spot um, to kind of get all that cumulative information and, and remove the bias and the misinformation and the, the issues that we've, we've seen as you speak about fake news and and other things, uh, we, and, and during this time, we've seen the social dilemma on and on. With that that in mind, you, I, I, don't, I don't know if the, you're working on a book, but you're also started codes, and, and you're you're working on this task force for digital transformation. Tell us a little bit more about some of these projects, maybe the book, and if that has a lot to do with digital or, or not, and, and kind of take us on, on where things have done during your pause and, and where they're going now moving forward. Sure. Thanks, Mark. I think one of the uh, big UN initiatives that came out in 2019 with, was the Secretary General's Digital Cooperation Roadmap. It's kind of a big vision, big global vision on how we're going to use digital tools to achieve the SDGs. And when that roadmap came out, one of the gaps in that roadmap was that sort of environment and climate action were 
they weren't missing, but they weren't amplified. And so um, my executive director, Inger Anderson, sort of offered to start looking at that question in more detail, like how can we make sure that that digital transformation is, is being used to accelerate environmental sustainability. And that conversation eventually led to the creation of this network, as you say, called CODES. So this is the Coalition for Digital Environmental Sustainability. This is meant to be a new part of the, the digital cooperation roadmap, focusing exactly on that question of how do we bridge the digital transformation and, and sustainability, uh, environmental sustainability areas. And as you said, the, 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 one of the fundamental uh, needs is to offer this kind of docking station. Like, how do we offer a docking station and a coordination platform for all these initiatives that are out there that are working on one part of this broader picture, um, but that aren't, aren't totally connected? So we're trying to identify sort of the five or six areas where we can really help bring actors together. And we're looking at sort of the question of data, uh, planetary data and data standards, we're looking at digital infrastructure and making sure that infrastructure is, is green and sustainable. Uh, we're looking at finance, uh, we're looking at um, consumers and, and, and livelihoods, and we're looking at uh, energy and then governance. So these are the areas that we're trying to rally around. And, and the, the real idea is for each of those six areas, coming up with a big, you know, like moonshot. What's the moonshot for data? What's the moonshot for digital infrastructure? And how can we begin to rally um, that ecosystem or those, those, those stakeholders around that moonshot to really begin to accelerate this idea of a, a digital planet for sustainability. So that's certainly um, one of the areas that, that I've been focusing on. So that's the codes issue. The other one is a, a book that I actually started writing uh, through Resilience Frontiers. I met a colleague there named Catherine Siforsina. Uh, she's from the private sector, I'm from the public sector. And we started talking about like, you know, what are these big forces of, of digital transformation that are gonna really accelerate environmental sustainability globally? So we started talking about it and we sort of uh, decided, well, why don't we write a book about it? And we, we start looking at cases of, of best practice and we start sort of really taking a systems approach as you mentioned at the outset, like what are the key operating systems of the human civilization that are blocking or, or you know, preventing environmental sustainability from scaling. Um, so if we look at each of these operating systems, can we identify a key barrier and can digital technologies help to remove that barrier so it can scale? And so we identified sort of five of these key operating systems. And, you know, the first one is really the operating system inside our head, right? The, sort of the, the, the human cognitive system. What is it about human cognition that is preventing environmental sustainability from scaling. We, from, from human cognition, we went to then sort of the social system, right? How are ideas in the social system sort of transformed into behaviors and, and, and norms? We went to the, from there, we went to the economic system and then the governance system and then the technology system. So for each of these systems, we're looking at the barriers and then we're trying to identify digital technologies that can really uh, address those barriers and enable the systems to better you know, interoperate and to basically begin to um, embed environmental sustainability into the code of each of those operating systems. And that's the whole kind of mantra of, of my work is, is looking at this, the fact that you know, the global economy is now dictated by code and algorithms primarily, and all of our economic and social transactions are being mediated through those codes and algorithms. And if we're gonna achieve global sustainability, we have to begin to embed environmental sustainability data, norms and metrics at the code level, right? So the algorithms need to start optimizing uh, for sustainability and, and begin to look at this combination of, of people, profit, and planet, right? So that's where we're really moving. And, and, and we're trying to then identify where are the big algorithms we need to be focusing in on and how can we use those algorithms to achieve sort of three main things. The first is how can we begin to nudge consumer behaviors, right, towards sustainability? The second is looking at supply chains, right? How can we help supply chains monitor their impact and disclose uh, their environment and climate performance. And the third area is looking at finance. Um, how can we start to connect uh, finance and, and sustainability through like FinTech applications and other, other uh, channels? So how do we begin to use digital tech to really influence consumers, supply chains, finance? And the fourth area we're looking at is procurement, public procurement. How can govern, governments procure with purpose? and begin to sort of influence the economy uh, through their procurement um, preferences. So that's, those are the areas we're trying to, we're really trying to influence with digital technologies. And that's what we unpack in both codes and in this book that I'm writing with Catherine.
Wow, that's absolutely amazing. I, I can't wait to get a copy and can't wait for it to come out. I know it's probably still a work in progress. It really brings up a, a couple other questions. So you ha have been working in the digital sphere with environment for a long time. So you came up with uh, or were the co-founder, co-director of Mac X, uh, MapX platform that helps stakeholders map and monitor natural resources in the environmental uh, change using you know, the best available planetary data, satellites, frontiering technologies. Um, and, and then also software X uh, as well. And then there was one other one, bio, it was a biodiversity one as well, but you've been doing this for a long time tied to the environment. And I'm sure in that process, you've seen these siloed approaches. Now, when you just spoke not only about codes and, and, and the book, there's a lot of terms or a lot of mentioning of systems. And for the UN, really, I mean, the, everyone you, you hear speaks about the limits to growth, growth which is uh, systems dynamic modeling, systems thinking, the, some even call it the Meadows Report, you know, uh, and the reason I bring that up is kind of that was almost the beginning of systems thinking within the UN, but it really wasn't until about 2018 from, from my outside view that the UN made this full transformation says, no, we're, we're going to stop the siloed linear approach to solving our grand challenges we're going to start implementing systems and systems dynamic modeling. And that's where, you know, even with the SDGs, they're all tied together as a system. You can't work on one without working on the others. But the other thing is they started to come up with these, these systems maps and diagrams and almost like a, a mind maps using systems thinking and dynamic modeling for the SDGs and some of the other things and other programs within the United Nations. At that same time, the World Economic Forum came out with transformational maps on, on their website. And it was also pre-discussed in uh, Klaus Schwab's book, The Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, and then finally in 2018, before the, the Davos meeting, he came out with those on the website, the transformational maps. And we've even seen the progress and evolution of those to how corporations, cities, countries can use that, those tools to kind of figure out where the feedback loops are, where the bottlenecks are, where the problems are in our thinking and how we can truly solve global grand challenges. And so um, uh, one, I wanna know, did the transformation happen a little bit before 2018? How have you seen that transformation? And, and what are some of the new tools that you're seeing, not only with codes and the others, and where you truly want to go, where, 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 where you're giving others an, a platform or a source to have an ecosystem, open source, decentralized, or how, however it's structured, of a systemic view of all those tools connected instead of going out to a thousand different users to get that data and have a lot of other complications in the process. I kind of want to dive a little bit deeper into sure. your knowledge and your thoughts and how your experiences have been with that. Yeah, thanks, Mark. As, as you, this is a great question. As you said, a lot of these ideas have been around, frankly, have been around since the 70s and 80s, right? Uh, whether it's systems thinking or whether it's circular economy, these, these, are, these are quite old ideas. And, and what I think happened is the idea was sound, but we actually lacked the data, the metrics, the analytical tools to kind of take it forward. And this is where I think digital technology has really been transformative. I think for the first time, we have the tools in place where we can begin to design a circular sort of economy and regenerative thinking. Um, and I think the same thing goes for system dynamics. We now have sort of the computers and the processing power at a planetary scale where we can begin to take those ideas you know, into, into reality. So I think 2018, um, yeah, that sounds about right, maybe a year or two earlier, but generally speaking, I think it became much more mainstream once we had the data and the processing power in place. And before, before then, we simply, I mean, we couldn't really, you know, if we're talking about monitoring global change in, in real time, uh, we really didn't have the tools to do it, or, it, you know, we may have had the tools, but it was just too expensive. 
Um, but with cloud processing and AI, I mean, we've really, the, the costs have just plummeted. Uh, it's practic, I mean, it's not free, but it's practically free to be able to do that now. Uh, and digital, to be frank, digital technology companies have really been uh, played a major part in that. They've provided a lot of support to the UN in order to enable this kind of global level analysis. So I think digital technologies have been one of the, one of the reasons why we've seen that shift. Um, and I think from, if you ask me what's the most important technology right now that will uh, really underpin kind of the idea of a circular economy, for me, the most important thing on the horizon right now is this idea of a digital product passport. The idea that every product or service in the economy will, will have kind of a data pod associated with it and you will be able to see its origin, its provenance, its environmental footprint, its carbon footprint, its recycling pathway, disposal pathway, it, the chemical footprint. You'll be able to you know, uh, obtain information about the entire life cycle of that product, all the risks, as well as the performance of that product in, in, in environmental and, and climate terms. And that will be fundamental as I said, for influencing consumer behaviors, for influencing procurement of public actors, procurement of private actors, and really uh, to disclose that information to the financial sector as, as part of environment, social, and governance frameworks. So I see that as transformative because that data can then drive decision-making by multiple actors in the economy and really begin to underpin this idea of, of circular economy because we can begin to track and trace where the different inputs to that particular product came from. We can track uh, where they are in, in their life cycle and we can begin to recover them more systematically as, as part of the circular uh, you know, economy framework. So I think this, the, the digital product passport is where we need to be focusing our efforts on uh, fundamentally. I know the European Commission as part of the Green Deal uh, is investing uh, in, in the digital product passport concept uh, in the European space. But obviously, if it's going to be transformative, we need to think about a global view on that. That'll affect global supply chains. There'll be global data that, that feeds into it. So we really need to be thinking about, you know, how do we develop the international standards now that'll underpin that digital product, product passport for every single product and service in the global economy? That's where we want to get to. Um, the, the, the commission is starting to look at uh, batteries, sort of, you know, circular batteries as a first use case, and then they'll be expanding out to, to other sectors. But if you really think about the amount of data that will be captured in this digital product passport, it's, it's truly mind boggling. If you think about all the, the parts of a supply chain and all the different businesses that'll need to feed data into that. Um, it'll be collecting data on consumption. It'll be collecting data on sort of the regulatory framework. There'll be all kinds of inputs to that digital product passport. And so we need to figure out, you know, how do we create that kind of that data ecosystem and those standards now so it can not only receive that data, but for, for really importantly, like we need to think through what are the use cases for that data and what behaviors do we want to drive with that data? So we build something that's fit for purpose to drive the behaviors we want to see in the marketplace. There, and I, I don't want to get controversial or anything, but I want, I, I kind of want to touch upon it. So we're talking that we're still making that shift. We're still moving there. It's coming together. We can see a pathway and the beginnings of this transformation. Uh, let's take, for example, Edward Snowden, a big controversial bit, you know, all, all sorts of drama around that. But even in the documentary or even in speaking with him about some of the tools that are available for government or, or, or that to use out there, pretty advanced, they're pretty much looking and listening and seeing tons of things. But it's not like, and this is also a term you use, digital with purpose, digital for good, digital for uh, discovery and that. And, and I think sometimes it's more of a security thing than it is a good for the environment, a planet or a humane technology. I mean, the Center for uh, uh, Humane Technology from Tristan Harris and, and um, the social dilemma and all those things have brought up a lot of those things. Do we really kind of have some of those things already and we just need to make them decentralized and open for everybody or uh, how, how do we understand that and uh, is that something that maybe you could tickle on uh, uh, does that play a factor or really we're, we're creating uh, um, the wheel from scratch again uh, without the help of the governments or, or how do we understand that. 
Yeah, it's a good question. I think, as you say, um, you know, the whole idea of a surveillance capitalism uh, where companies begin to um, systematically collect data on our consumption preferences and then use that to manipulate our preferences and drive further consumption, that's a huge risk. That is a massive, massive risk. In fact, I'd say that's the massive downside risk of digitalization is that it actually amplifies consumption and it micro targets us to consume more. And I think that's probably what you're seeing already, you know, you know, in terms of the digital economy, in terms of what it's being used for. Um, you know, the, the, top, the top eight companies in the US, the top eight uh, digital companies in the US have a combined uh, market capitalization of around $8 trillion, which is worth more than 156, the GDP of 156 countries, right? The imbalance is crazy in terms of their market power and their dominance and their potential to collect and share data on what we on our preferences. So I think that's that is a major issue that we need to we need to address. And uh, the other uh, side of the spectrum that Snowden talks about is sort of government surveillance, right? State surveillance, um, and the states use it to basically um, monitor who is who is against the state and to, to basically you know arrest uh, those that are you know that are that are protesting and that are, have counter views. Um, that's certainly another massive risk, and we see that happening as well. I think, I think the the, the best solution there, and the only solution, frankly, and I think Snowden talks about this as well, is, is transparency. Right? We need full transparency in in what data is being collected, what's it being used for. We need the algorithms um, that are that are collecting and optimizing to be disclosed. We need some information about what those optim what those algorithms are optimizing for. Um, we need to really understand who, what kind of data is being collected and what it's being used for. So I think, I think transparency is absolutely fundamental and that's the only way we're gonna have sort of a, a trust in this system. Right now, I would say the trust levels are very low in terms of trusting the, the, digital, uh, the digital companies to, to do what's in the public interest. My, it's funny, I, I watched a movie over the weekend with my kids called Mitchell's versus the Robots, which is basically all about, can we trust big tech? To, to do what's in the interest of humanity. And, uh, you know, I think, I, I think the, the jury is, uh, it's a bit mixed right now. I think some big tech term firms are doing some amazing things. As I said, Google is, is really doing some incredible things with Google Earth Engine, for example. Uh, so is Microsoft and so is Amazon. So they have their sort of four good uh, parts of the companies and, and they're tremendous, but they're also amplifying and accelerating hype, you know, consumption and, and, uh, perpetuating fake news and doing, you know, other things that are not leading to sustainability. So, again, it's it's about it's about using these technologies for good, um, using them to ensure they accelerate the right kind of behaviors and not the wrong ones. If you if you look at uh, Reid Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, he says that to be a successful social media platform, you have to amplify at least one of the seven deadly sins. Right. And, and that's just not <laughs> what we want at a global scale driving, you know, sustainability. Right. So we really need to kind of pick apart what are the values that these that these algorithms are are accelerating and are they the right ones? And if they're not, we really have to reconfigure that thinking to get them to move much more to sustainability, to privacy, to security, to regeneration, all the values we want to amplify. We need to see those values encoded into these platforms and algorithms. So yeah, it's a big challenge, but uh, definitely, I think the transparency card is the is the one we need to we need to uh, play to, to 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 try to manage it. Uh, I and I need your clarification on this as well. So you talked about the the passport, and and um, I see in some respects there's a certain amount of um, it's a trustless system, and there's also something of that transparency and openness and decentralized in there, but it's a form of sovereignty. Um, uh, not just that now in today's day and age, we have digital diplomats emerging to kind of represent the, the governance of, of the digital realm, uh, uh, maybe even digi digital or, um, countries of sovereignty, but to have a passport like that also gives you something that cannot be taken by someone else or manipulated if it's done in the right way. And, and it's something that, you know, you, you can get a full transparency and a ledger of where things are connecting and going. And, uh, but I, on the flip side also gives you that sovereignty, I, I think as far as a, 
global citizen or some, you know, someone who, who has that, but I, I don't know if I'm right on that. That's kind of what I hear out in some respects. Well, I see that I see them as two very distinct, you know, ideas, the digital product passport for, for products and services. I fully agree that I think the end goal there is, is full transparency of its performance across the supply chain. I uh, couldn't agree with you more. And I think if we can achieve that, I mean, that would be that would be just transformative if we could achieve it. And if we could create those global standards, uh, that would be great. The, the problem, of course, is that a lot of there are a lot of interests that don't want that level of transparency. Right. They want to keep their performance hidden. Uh, they don't want it in the public view uh, because they know it's 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 bad for their reputations. So we'll need to figure out, you know, how do we counter the interests that want to maintain the current, you know, the current status quo. Um, and that'll be that will be difficult. That will be a difficult uh, political process. But again, it'll be fundamental if we're going to achieve the sort of planetary scale sustainability. Now, a, a digital passport for individuals, that's obviously also on the horizon. Um, I think that's where we're also going to see kind of a, a proliferation of ideas like a learning passport, for example, a health passport, all of these kind of thematic things that go with your identity. That's also going to be transformative, uh, clearly transformative. But I think in that context, the, the, the need for privacy and security and, and management of all that data is obviously going to be imperative. And I think the first time there is a, there is a breach of that trust and that privacy, you know, there's going to be some shake, there's going to be some, some, some immediate fallout. So I, I see them as, as two, um, as two kind of two parallel ideas, both with transformative, absolutely transformative potential. But I think on the, on the individual side, that's also where digital technologies can really help us. I think if you look at some of the latest statistics, um, about 65% of people, they do want to procure and purchase sustainable products, and they do want to have sustainable lifestyles, uh, but only about 23% actually do so, right? So there's this gap between our attitude and our behavior. And I'm hoping that digital technologies can really help close that gap and make sustainability kind of as simple and seamless and easy as possible. Um, so that's where, again, this idea of the digital product passport or the individual passport, you can begin to then have kind of full transparency on all your behavior, on all your purchases, over the course of a year and, and start to understand where could you make the biggest improvements in your, in your lifestyle, right? And, and, you know, an AI algorithm could really analyze, you know, your full history of purchasing and help you identify here are the main areas where you could make some improvements, here are the main behaviors you could adopt and really help people sort of take on a much more sustainable uh, lifestyles. So I think we need to make it as easy and simple and seamless as possible to be sustainable. And that really has to become kind of the default mode it really frankly it shouldn't really be optional it should kind of be the default of every platform uh and if you choose not to be sustainable you can opt out right you can sort of find a non-sustainable option but ultimately the the search results and all the kind of comparability metrics should really be driving us towards sustainability now, the, yeah, there's a couple of interesting things i want to touch upon so um the ESG has been, become a big environmental social governance has become a big term um, since the pandemic and it's gotten even more. It was kind of in the beginnings, but it's actually pretty old. Just like we said, the, the limits to growth and systems thinking is pretty old. Co uh, uh, Secretary General at the time, Kofi Annan, was actually the one who first coined the term environmental social governance. And, and it's kind of had a, a whole movement between health, safety, environment, to compliance, to corporate social responsibility, to environmental social governance, and it's taken that path. But we're seeing that it's, it's a better model for efficiency to increase profits. It's outperforming out uh, ESG and sustainable index funds are outperforming conventional non-sustainable uh, index funds. Uh, hands down, and, and it wasn't just in 2020, it's moving into 2021, and it's here to stay. But there's one thing that you kind of tickled upon of where we're going, we're actually going beyond ESG to a regenerative capitalism or to regenerative platforms. And this is what kind of where I want to go and tie into to the digital transformations and codes and the things that you're working on. Because when people hear regenerative platform models or platform business models, they all, I think, hardware, software, coding, uh, IT, 
something, but that's actually platforms and infrastructure. It's a sustainable infrastructure. It's one that's regenerative that will work forever. And, and so I want to kind of hear your views on that. But I also um, am tying back to one other thing that you that you mentioned. You talked about the three P's, people, planet, and profit. And that's kind of where you're going with on, on the book in some respects. And I believe it was 2019 or 2020, John Elkington, who actually coined the term over 24 years ago or uh, 20 years ago, the, the triple P's, he actually rescinded in his book, The Green Swans. And he said, I take that back because we need to go. And this is probably where you got regenerative capitalism. He says, we need to go to regenerative capitalism. And it's actually even a step beyond that. It's this regenerative economies and regenerative platform models. And so I want to see how that's tying into what you're working on and what your thoughts on how we're slowly getting on the bandwagon. It's taken us a long time to see that some of these models that have been out there for a while are not just good for investments. They're good for business, organizational structures. They are resilient in times of all those organizations that had ESG ingrained in their business model kept going during the pandemic, delivered essential services. Their profits grew. They're, they're, they didn't have to lay people off. There's a form of resilience because it's that platform, that infrastructure that can make it through tough times and, and gives it that resilience. And that's kind of, I'm trying to kind of lead you, if you could see in some respects on how we're going to get into resilience and into those true models that we need to be into yeah. to in the future that are autonomous or that just work and that are better systems that our human minds can't com can't handle that complexity or that chaos or that systems thinking. Thanks. That's a fantastic question again. And, and within the ESG space, I, I would just make a couple of comments first. The first is that, yes, as you say, ESG is coming on strong. Um, but if you look at the overall amount of funds that are kind of ESG funds, it's about $2 trillion out of $97 trillion in the global stock market. So it's still only about 2% of global capital markets. Uh, so it's it's a small amount. It's rising. It, it, it doubled last year already. Um, but it is it is still small relative to you know the overall market. So there's still a lot of room to go, is my point. I think the second thing on ESG that's really important is that we still, you know, despite the fact that it's growing, we still need more standardized metrics on how to actually calculate it. I think there's a lot of ESG claims uh, which aren't necessarily backed up by, you know, by authoritative uh, data. And I think we really need to get sort of global ESG standards in place so we can make sure that those claims are validated. I think the world of, of spatial finance um, is certainly moving in that direction. This is again, using all of the tools out there in the digital world like earth observation and AI to really uh, calculate the, the ESG performance objectively and to sort of compare that with what the companies are reporting. So that's the first point is, is we really do need to expand ESG, um, make sure we have the metrics in place but your point is, is exactly a good one. We actually need kind of ESG 2.0. ESG right now is kind of mitigating impact. It's not thinking about sort of what's the overarching purpose you can contribute to with your company. And so we need to look at kind of the, the impact mitigation side, but also the purpose side and the mission side and how companies can contribute uh, systematically to the, to the positive achievement of, of the SDGs. So certainly that's that's where the ESG space uh, needs to move. Now, if you look at some of the really interesting work that's out there right now, I think uh, there's a there's a, a a company or sorry a, a initiative called uh, Digital with Purpose Movement. So this is basically the idea that ICT companies want to be able to express in the marketplace both their their ESG performance as well as their positive SDG contributions, and they're coming up with this. Sort of this uh, mark, which which is a which is a which is a, a metric on how they're doing on both fronts. And for me, the digital with purpose movement is 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 exactly the right way to uh, to sort of progress this model, where we begin to look at both the positive and the negative. We we quantify it and we put it into some kind of mark or some kind of metric, so that consumers can really understand, you know, what's the performance. And I think what's good about digital with purpose is yes, you know, at a very simple level, you get a single score and a mark. You can then unpack that and you can begin to see in more detail where each company is moving on different fronts, right? Is it 
how is it on the environmental front versus the human rights front versus the, the governance front and begin to kind of get a much more nuanced perspective. So I definitely think there's a lot of interesting movement in the ESG space uh, and the digital technologies can fundamentally amplify that. Uh, but there's work to do still, especially on the metrics and on the, as you, as you point out, on, on ensuring that we have much more of a, a positive contribution and moving much more to the circular economy. And as you say, the whole, the whole space of regeneration. That's not yet, as far as I can see, that's not really being captured yet uh, in, in that world. No, there's, I mean, there's not a lot of books out on it. There uh, is a movement on the, the platform modeling where they've really gone into regenerative ecosystem um, business model. So platform design and how, how they can help companies transition. Um, the, the other push, I totally agree with you. It's a, you're spot on on the percentage of the market, on the percentage of what we're currently addressing with ESG. Uh, the, the thing humanity's always struggled with, though, is this we don't understand the exponential curve and how quickly things happen and come about and how mm. quickly we'll reach something. What's already in the pipelines and been in the pipelines for a long time is a uh, uh, ESG EU and the European Union taxonomy is getting ready to be voted on and decided on. Um, and then also we're seeing, and that comes up uh, to 2024 at the latest, we'll already have voted on it. And it'll be in, in the practice where everyone will have to adhere to that, at least in the EU. Um, and if they're doing business internationally, but an EU-based company is still going to have to adhere to it. And, and uh, um, then also comments from BlackRock CEO and, and, and other things on where if these aren't there, there's going to be certain types of punishments uh, uh, or uh, consequences because of that inaction or that not progressing in that certain way. Um, the main thing is, is we really need the digital tools and all these aspects to help support us. We're talking about complexity. We're talking about systems and to eat, no matter how big your organization is, um, it needs to be um in line with government systems, regulatory systems, so that that whole, not just reporting, but also how can you stay up to date on the, the firmware, the software update, where you need to go, where your business is going in an exponentially growing world, that support structure really needs to be there. And so I, I, I'm, I'm glad you uh, addressed that. The, I mean, the last... The last thing, and, and we talked about Green Swans and John Elkington and the Triple P, and that it's really this, this almost, we should actually leapfrog into a regenerative system. Mm. We'll see more, more models and things emerge and more tools, and hopefully they'll be tied into these digital systems that we're discussing. The, a book from... Um, Paul Hawkins called Regeneration will come out in September and a couple other new books that are really pushing on these regener regeneration, regenerative models that are all the core function of what we've been discussing in, uh, on resilience and resilience frontiers. How do we still breathe and enjoy nature and have food and resources in that time? Um, after the hurricanes, after the climate catastrophes, after the digital crashes or whatever could happen, how do we still function the next hour, the next day with the basic resources of humanity to keep up with these planetary boundaries? And during this time, uh, past 18 months, we've seen, and you tickled upon these as well, donut economics, real big push circular economy, real big push on planetary boundaries from Stockholm Resilience Center and the Potsdam Institute of Climate Change um, and, and, and many other Mariana Matsukato and others mm -hmm. talking about these different economic models that are really all tied to our planet, the planetary boundaries, to the environment, to this environmental social governance, but more so this symbiotic earth that there's no way that we can decouple economic growth or economy or from our natural systems. It can be digitized. It can be decentralized. It can be very, very transformative and a new innov uh, innovative era 
or a new change in innovation that transport catapults us into the future, but it has to be in line with that ecological aspect. And um, that's where I want to kind of go into some of the tools and, that you're working with and codes and some of the other projects, many other projects you're working with. In the Connect University, the EU Futurium, I think is how, how they call it, the Summer School for Digital for Our Planet, they talked about the digital twin for the earth. They talked heavily about Copernicus and all the wonderful data from Copernicus. I know you've worked a lot with uh, planet, uh, is it planet earth or planet health? Um, or I think maybe they're just called planet that does a lot. And then Google earth and, and many other uh, geospatial data points that are kind of compiling and partnering with each other to bring us this digital ecosystem for the earth, the future of where we're going and what's going on. And so I'd like to know where that's going, what you're very optimistic and hopeful for, and why do we need a, a digital twin for the earth? Or what does that give us? What does that bring us? And what do the compilation of an ecosystem of all these other tools, what is that going to give us? How is that going to help us? Sure. Thanks, Mark. I, I think we need to, again, take a sort of a step back and, and ask, you know, we've adopted these SDGs, right? We've adopted various uh, multilateral environmental agreements, but what's our capacity like to actually monitor their implementation, right, at a global level? And our capacity is not great, to be frank. I mean, if you look at the, the environmental SDGs, if you look at the indicators, about 58% of them cannot be measured globally, right? So we can't even assess progress globally against, you know, and if you look at the, the Paris Agreement, if you look at the Biodiversity Convention, it's taking about three to four years to, to do a global stock take which is a ridiculous amount of time if you're trying to have real-time action. If you're trying to create those feedback loops, as you mentioned, to inform system level thinking, you need that in, in you know, weekly and monthly, not every four years. And that's the first thing that I think the, the, the digital ecosystem uh, idea can really help is to bring all of this data together into a, into a planetary scale uh, system so we can begin to monitor in more real time the state, the status of our SDG commitments, of our multilateral environmental agreements, um, and other commitments we're, you know, we're trying to, we're trying to uh, take forward. So we need that kind of planetary scale dashboard, right? Where do we sit right now with respect to our agreements and our commitments, and what's the health of the planet doing? That has to be kind of the prerequisite to everything you spoke about in terms of regeneration. We need, we need that data first and foremost. So all of these tools like the digital twin of the Earth and Planet Labs and some of these other uh, Copernicus, um, uh, some of these other big uh, earth observation initiatives and modeling initiatives, those are kind of fundamental, I would say, in terms of generating data, but also in terms of doing that kind of system level analysis at a planetary scale. And that's where they really, uh, they really, really excel. The Destination Earth, this digital twin of the planet that the commission is building, that's a planetary scale model, right? A systems level planetary scale model, which can really enable us to look at the connection between kind of the environmental systems on the one hand and the social economic systems on the other and begin to understand the relationships, the trends, and where we can begin to intervene uh, with policies and regulations to really start looking at some of those risk factors. So I think that's that's a fundamental investment we have to make. But then once we have that data and, and those an analytics, as I said, we have to start streaming that into the algorithms of the digital economy, right? So they begin to take them into account in a real-time way and begin to optimize uh, for sustainability. And as, you, as we mentioned, those algorithms need to be considering profit, people, and planet. Um, but what, what's, I think we have to sort of take this forward in, in, in two steps. The first thing, we need to help companies understand that they can still be profitable even when they take in, into account people and planet. So there's still profitability. If you look at some of the latest uh, WEF analysis, their, their numbers are ranging from anywhere to, to between 30 to $50 trillion of potential, uh, potential profit can be, um, can be garnered uh, by, by going sustainable, right? So there's a huge economic benefit uh, from going in a sustainable direction. As you mentioned, ESG funds are outperforming traditional funds. So that's kind of step one, I think, is, is, is just uh, putting to rest this idea that sustainability is not profitable. It's just wrong, right? So that's number one, is sort of tr transitioning to those, uh, those business models where they begin to take that into account. And then, as you said, step two, once we sort of uh, cross that first chasm, step two 
is then thinking more about regeneration and moving into circularity, right? Um, so I, I think this is always the case where the thinking about the solutions is probably 10 years ahead of the practice in, in the private sector. And we kind of get frustrated at the pace of change. Um, but what's, what, you know, what's positive is we are seeing those shifts moving to those, those sustainable business models and, and, and much more consideration to profit people and planet. And I look, at, I look at companies like Amazon, for example. Amazon is starting now. They have a new program called the, um, the Climate Pledge Friendly Initiative, where within the Amazon marketplace, they're beginning to show which of the products actually have some kind of environmental sustainability certification. So they're looking at 19 different certifications and they're starting to inventory in a systematic way which products have those certifications so that consumers that want to go green and want to go climate friendly can do so at scale. Now, if, if that starts to scale and if Amazon starts to then kind of nudge consumers towards those products and services, that would have you know, transformative impacts. So I can, see, I can see positive steps being taken by companies like, like Amazon. I can see positive steps being taken by companies like SAP, by Microsoft. Uh, by Google, they're moving in that direction. And I think they're exploring the market and they're trying to understand you know, where the demand lies and how they continue to be profitable. But that's why it's really so important that we have kind of these, um, these, these pincer, uh, this sort of pincer operation where consumers start demanding more sustainable products by getting access to data and governments do the same. And so when we can start to push the demand from consumers and governments towards sustainable products, companies will respond to that you know, naturally. Um, so yeah, I, I completely agree, but I do think it's sort of a multi-step process. And I think the good news is we are seeing those transitions happening. Um, and now it's a question of how do we speed and scale them and how do we take a look at the systemic barriers and remove them with, with digital tools? Uh, you know, that's amazing. And I, I really believe that's what we need is the right direction that we're going in. And it's so important that, these tools are there to use and that we're educated and empowered with the ability to understand why we could use them, and why it comes about um, this. I, when I speak, and you've heard me speak before of, about the environment and the planet, I always show the blue marble or earth rise. And, and I ask kind of a, it's not a trick question, but a, it's, a, it's a telling question. How do we have this? Why do we have this image? And, and it's because of in, innovation. It's because of emerging technology that we have that. And so uh, innovation and, and information is empowering. It keeps us from being ignorant. It helps us to make informed decisions. And it was also a, a little bit of a push for the environmental movement and awareness of our planet and that it's our only home and how how to preserve and protect it. Now we, we need to take that up another notch to really get up to speed with our exponentially digitally growing world um, and our environment and the climate issues that are happening so that we can make those informed decisions in that expedient amount of time, weeks to months, uh, no more than a few months because then it's not real time anymore if we're not doing in that. And one of the biggest, um, in my opinion, ecological, uh, economic, ecological economics or models out there is the global hectare. It's used by Earth Overshoot Day and the, uh, to calculate the overshoot day. And this year, July 29th is Earth Overshoot Day. It was done by um, uh, Professor Matas Wackernagel who does the Overshoot Foundation or organization. And that model has been around for 35 years. It's used in the scientific community. It's used at the UN. It's used by everybody. But that data, I think, is six years old by the time mm -hmm. they come out. Mm -hmm. So the data that they just came out with July 29th for Earth Overshoot Day, I think, is you know at least four or five years old. That's just not giving us an accurate picture on, on our true overshoot and, and to, for us to be responsive. You know, we need food, water, and resources tomorrow, the next hour, 
not four years later. And if we're miscalculating it by four years later, what kind of catastrophes could happen? And so uh, this transition needs to occur much more, but there's a big question on this transformation, on this change. And that was another thing that was really gone into depth on this Connect University Digital for Our Planet was e-waste, using renewables, getting off of fossil fuels for data centers, for new technologies that we're not doing data or technology that's cradle to grave or creating all sorts of emissions or heat pockets, um, creating issues in our world. And so I'd like maybe if, if you don't mind just addressing that for a second, what you've seen and what your concerns have been voiced to you as you're making this move and say, well, yeah, you want to go digital, you want to move us forward, but it's just going to push forward this whole e-waste, this whole emissions, because now we're going to put more commute, computing power, use more fossil fuels, et cetera. Um, if you could maybe address that or see what you've seen, that would be nice. Yeah, thanks very much. Let me just go back to this question of information. I, 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 I think information about sort of in global environmental challenges can, can inform some behaviors and can inform some actions, especially for those that, um, you know, have sort of an, an enlightened awareness about our planetary situation. But it's not, it's not a silver bullet either for the, for the planet. Um, you know, there are a lot of people that either are not aware of the impact or frankly are, are too busy leading their, their lives to sort of, you know, have the time to think about it. Um, and to be frank, uh, you know, being a sustainable consumer is difficult. It's even difficult for those who, who understand the issues in detail. So I don't think that information alone is enough. I think we need to be actively digitally nudging and, in, and encouraging and creating incentives towards the sustainable consumption. And, and I, you know, I don't fault people um, if they have the information and they don't always uh, buy uh, sustainably. Again, I don't fault them either because it is complex and difficult uh, or simply because you know, they, they don't know what, what the options are or they don't trust the information that's being given to them. So, um, so we need to go. We need to go beyond information as the as our only tool, and begin to sort of, as I said, actively nudging, gamification, um, all the techniques we can use to really encourage and incentivize uh, behavioral shifts is is where we need to uh, go. But it, but as you said, right now about half the planet is disconnected. Um, we need to we need to close that digital divide you know, very very quickly. But as we do that. We need to ensure that we're not creating new uh, impacts on the environment, either from the energy or from the supply chains of ICT. And as you said, one of the big challenges right now is e-waste. If you look at the global statistics, 17% uh, 17, uh, 17 of e-waste is recycled, right? Which is virtually uh, nothing, frankly. It's 53 million metric tons per year, which is about the equivalent of 125,000 uh, Boeing 747 jets. Uh, which is, you know, larger than the number of aircraft ever produced. So it's a huge amount of, of waste. And that's exactly why the ideas of a circular economy are so, uh, are so powerful, especially for the ICT world. We, we should be reclaiming as many of those components and metals and minerals as possible um, and, and recycling them and putting them back into circulation. Uh, so e-waste is, is a massive issue that needs to be a fundamental priority. And, but as you said, the second one is renewable energy. We need to ensure that the digital, the digital economy and the digital ecosystem uh, is green and we need to be procuring um, uh, options and really embedding energy efficiency again at the code level, right? The software itself and the infrastructure itself needs to be automatically um, you know, uh, selecting the most energy efficient uh, ways of operating. And so again, we need to be thinking about that as we close that digital divide, how do we ensure that we're also uh, investing in green energy solutions, and how do those how do those two come together? So you know, digital and green energy are are a, a twin investment that are made as as this digital divide is closed. So yeah, I, I couldn't agree more that digital is not a panacea. There are serious issues that need to be thought through. I think you know, in addition to the energy and uh, e waste issue, the the other big one is what's called the, the the rebound effect. So the more digital technologies kind of increase efficiency and reduce price, the more demand there is for those products and services, which basically ultimately sort of undermine any gains that are made, right? 
And digital rebound is, is a real issue as well, especially when it comes to uh, consumer products. The cheaper they become, the more they're consumed, the more resources are wasted, and basically you don't actually have a net benefit. So I think uh, we need to be looking at exactly at those questions as well and really having an honest conversation about, you know, how, there are opportunities, but there are risks and there are negative consequences and how do we, how do we maximize one and minimize the other? Absolutely. Think that, that's spot on. And, and it's something that's not always addressed, but I really like that Connect University and you and, and many others are taking this conversation up and how do we get better data centers that are using renewables and using heat efficiently and how are we thinking about the big waste and, and, and energy around, you know, cryptocurrencies or whatever else is going on. It's a, it's a big aspect that really needs to be addressed. I want to probably ask you uh, our, the first hardest question, even though probably all of the questions that we've had have been pretty hard uh, for, for most people, but it is uh, around this uh, digital ID or digital passport or, or universal identification. And the UN works a lot on UNID 2020 and, and uh, many other things on how can we get the people who don't have identification, identification and the basic rights, microcredits and bank the unbankable, many other problems around that area. But I want to tie it into another question, which is uh, may, maybe there's a transition. Do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel a world would work without borders, nations, divisions of humanity, one from another. And the reason I kind of say that is during this pandemic, the pandemic's been a global citizen, food's been a global citizen, energy's been a global citizen, climate change, water, air has all been a global citizen, species have, and we've found more nationalism, nationalism and division from one another but is there something to be said about having global citizenship, not a global globalization, but global citizenship where we are interacting very similar to the digital world or very similar to our environment? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think you, you know, you've got two realities right now. You've kind of got the physical reality of nation states and products and services in the real economy. And you've got sort of the digital reality, which is global. Uh, and, and the two are, the, the, obviously the two are connected, but the, the member state sort of sovereignty reality um, is not going to go away anytime soon, frankly. I, I can't see of a, of a pathway, as you say, to sort of dissolve borders and to come up with sort of a global citizen, uh, you know, constituency uh, overnight. I, I, I think that member states are here to stay. And I think uh, clearly, uh, that needs to be managed. But as you say, we are global citizens. And, and if we're going to react to any of these big existential threats, we need to operate in a global way, as you said. And we need to really understand that. And I think that's one of the things that COVID really did help us see is that we are all connected and we do uh, face existential threats together. And we need to collaborate to face those. And whether that's COVID or climate change or biodiversity loss or pollution, it's got to be collective action at a, at a global scale. And I think digital technologies can actually give you that sense of kind of global citizenship. So somehow we need to have both where we, we, where we are obviously a part of countries where member states are, are governing uh, sovereign territories, but where we can also be, become global citizens uh, in that digital channel, as you, as you rightly pointed out. So yeah, I, I can, a, a future will, will have to take both of those kind of physical realities and digital realities uh, into account. As you said, though, going back to this uh, this question of the moon, the Apollo moon launch and sort of looking back, I do think that this is where digital technologies can really help us kind of be much more immersive in that global in those global challenges, because, as you say, these these footprint analyses, they've been around for 20 years and, 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 and uh, uh, Mr. Wagernackel has been working on this for 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 ages, but they don't translate into sort of an emotive response from people there. It's an intellectual exercise about how many earths are we consuming? It doesn't touch you in the heartstrings. And I think this is where, I hope this is where digital technologies can also really help us not just visualize that, but feel it 
it through an immersive experience. So I'm, I've been looking at, uh, at AR and VR and, and trying to see, can that really help me as a citizen understand that kind of planetary perspective? It's certainly moving in the right direction. I haven't yet found the killer app. Uh, I've got a VR headset on my computer and I've downloaded just about everything I can find that would sort of give me that, that experience. It's not there yet, um, but I think it's moving in that direction. And I'm really hoping at some point soon, there is an application that really helps you kind of understand your you know, role in the world and the, the planetary perspective and the big uh, you know, changes and damages that humanity is, is wreaking, you know, ha um, causing across the planet. And to not just sort of help you experience that emotionally, but then to help you act on it in a systematic way. Like what can I do as a person living in this particular country? So it needs to then help connect your kind of emotional response to behaviors you can undertake. And then again, using that digital technology to begin to reinforce those behaviors, right? I think that's where we need to move. So if you get inspired to take action through some kind of immersive technology, then you need to ask that, you know, your mobile applications to then help you become a better citizen um, and through various behaviors you can undertake. So I think this is connect, this is coming, uh, this is coming to fruition. These connections are slowly being put in place. Um, but that 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 sort of fully immersive VR experience that kind of transforms your mindset uh, is not there yet, but I, I'm hopeful that it'll it'll be coming very soon. Yeah, I I I kind of have techno lust. I've had it my my whole life. I love technology. It was one of my first degrees, but I have a VR headset <laughs> here as well, and, and I, I've done I've done the same experiment as you have. Uh, there, there, you know, is the uh, uh, Apollo moon landing, which is which is nice, and it, it comes pretty close, and it's a nice experience, especially since I talk about it a lot, and I've read the book uh, uh, um, Earthrise and Overshoot Effect, and and the different the different books that are out there, and kind of heard the stories. I believe it's it's nice. It's not there, but we're uh, we're we're edging out close. There's this great book that I just got. It's the Blue Marble Evaluation. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Uh, it's got a glare on it, but it's the Blue Marble Evaluation. Also moving in the direction of everything that we've been talking about today, and how can we use it for purpose, use it for good? How can we uh, use it as something, as an assistant for humanity to really get into complexity science, chaos theory, systems thinking, and, and use those to, to get us on that path and keep us up to speed with the way our world is growing in, in, in a way that uh, is a world that works for everyone. And that brings me to the hardest question I have for you today, and that is really the burning question, WTF, and that is not the swear word, um, <laughs> although maybe maybe you said that during the past months. Um, it's really what's the future, and it's more so the plural. What's the futures? I believe there's multiple futures, but in your vision for you and what your work is and what you want to do with codes and, and digital What's the future, David? Where are we going? What's the plan? Yeah, the future, in, in, in my view, is fundamentally going to rely, obviously, on this, on this collaboration between public and private sectors. And I think this is where the UN has not really catalyzed in the last number of decades deep collaboration between the two. Um, and in my view, the private sector is absolutely fundamental to achieve the kind of changes we're talking about. So we need to engage, the, the I would say, two, two kinds of private sector entities. The private sector... Obviously, the, you know where the where the current economic power lies. So that's kind of the digital the digital technology companies. Um, they need to play their role in accelerating environmental sustainability. They fundamentally each and each and every one of them have massive reach and influence. At the moment, it's about four four uh, billion people they're reaching, um, two trillion consumers. They can do a massive amount to really accelerate environmental sustainability and sustainable consumption. So they need to do their role and fundamentally start to in incorporate what we're talking about into their algorithms, into their platforms, into their apps, and be a part of a planetary change. I think the other group is, of course, um, entrepreneurs and, and small and medium-sized enterprises. Right? There's a huge community of of growing companies wanting to. 
um, uh, help find solutions for environmental sustainability challenges across all the sectors. They also need to be supported, to be enabled, and to make sure they're not crowded out by, by big tech and some of the big mature firms, right? So level the playing, level the playing field, empowering them uh, with digital technologies. And as you say, helping them build uh, these regenerative business models, um, helping them contribute to the, to the circular economy. These are all gonna be fundamental. And, and the reason why I'm putting so much more emphasis on private sector actors is basically it's time question, right? We've got 10 years left to achieve the SDGs or less than that. Governments um, are obviously fundamental, but they don't work and they don't regulate at the same speed and scale as companies do, right? Um, the, the time lag between private sector action and public sector action is, is significant. And so um, we need to be you know, accelerating action through private sector investment and private sector companies. And then public sector has to become, a, become much more agile in the way it governs. So it needs to be, it needs to start regulating more quickly and, and adapting those regulations uh, again, faster and in a more digitally appropriate way. So we need to get to a point where laws uh, are digital, right? We need to get to digitalization of laws and where those laws can begin to interact as part of the, you know, the codes of these private sector platforms. Again, that's part of this sort of digital ecosystem thinking. Ideally, we get to the point where laws are digital, laws inform uh, the, the codes of these platforms, and then the performance of these platforms report back to the coded laws, right? So we can get kind of this digital ecosystem uh, moving and we can get these different platforms talking to each other, sharing information, and as you say, creating those essential feedback loops so that we're reinforcing the behaviors we wanna see and obviously penalizing those we don't wanna see. I kind of, um, I don't want to poke fun at uh, Peter Diamandis, but I don't know if you're uh, well aware of uh, Singularity University. Peter Diamandis uh, said four, maybe four or five years ago now, he says, you know, we've got these rising billions coming online that will have the power, uh, computing power that took us to the moon in the palm of their hands, a smartphone and, and, um, I don't think we've hit it yet. I, I think I don't think we've had those three billion come online with their new smartphones and seen the revolutions quite like he discussed at that time. But I have this underlying feeling that that it's coming. Uh, is it good that it hasn't reached that yet because the apps and the systems digitally are not where it needs to be to make sure that we can swing those 3 billion new people coming online with smartphones so that they don't fall into this social dilemma trap or that they have the right tools to get the right information to go in the right direction. Uh, so is it a positive thing or am I, I have those 3 billion rising billions come about already and nothing happened? Uh, I, that's kind of a, a question of what you've seen or, or what, how you feel about that as well. Yeah, as you say, right now we're in a situation where we have about two billion uh, consumer e-commerce e consumers online, uh, with four billion people on the internet, and and there's still a big digital divide. As you said, I think you're probably right. It's it's probably a good thing that it hasn't scaled to the at the speed that Peter had mentioned, because a lot of the platforms and apps are not yet fully embedding sustainability into their business models yet. So had they come online, it, it's sort of the pace of his predictions that could have been catastrophic. Uh, you know, it could have accelerated consumption and basically led to um, further climate, you know, further climate change, further biodiversity loss and further pollution. And this is why this is sort of we have this moment in time right now, this window where if the big uh, tech firms could actually take into account this potential, uh, we could be transformative in terms of their impact. Right. So they're, they're and as I said, they're moving in that direction slowly. They're making sort of incremental changes. And they're seeing how the market reacts and then they're sort of you know adjusting as they go um but we really want to see as i said we really want to see major commitments from all the platform companies on how they're going to take into account environmental sustainability at the algorithmic level not i mean some of the companies are kind of making big commitments on uh, climate zero or, or net zero by 2030 and 2050 and that's important and that's good but they're not changing their business model Right, and it's the business model that has to change, and we need to see a, a different business model in, in how they go forward. And you know, a good example would be Google. Um, if if we're talking about kind of you know ad-based business models, they could prioritize businesses 
that are sustainable for advertising, right? They can have a two-tiered structure and those that are you know, sustainable or have ESG certification uh, could get one model and those that aren't get another, right? And so they could, they could really incentivize in their business model sustainability and, and prioritize companies that are, that are acting in accordance. Um, the same thing could happen in Amazon. I mean, there's all kinds of things they can do to really incentivize and promote sustainability. And as I said, um, they're, they're doing it incrementally, but we want to see some big commitments next year. We really want them to be a part of the solution. Yeah, I mean, it, we started out our conversation about uh, Microsoft Teams and how you really like some of the progress of Microsoft. I would have to um, second that and, and just uh, agree, especially in 2020, I was speaking at Davos and at DLD and different events for, for BOMA. And it was just right after Microsoft had come out with their big ambitions and um, their fund and, and, and that, but there was, there was three main pillars of what their objectives were. And one of those pillars was kind of missed by most people. They didn't understand the historical precedence that it, that it made. And it really was a historical precedence because it put it raised the bar higher and it also started a catapult for other businesses and organizations like Google, like Apple to say, okay, we need to raise our ambitions as well. And that ambition that kind of fell was swept under the carpet or not fully understood is that they were going to, since they've been in business, they're going to remove all their historical carbon emissions. And that's a step in the right direction. Instead of saying, we're going to meet this by 2030, or we're going to reduce our emissions by 70%. They says, no, no, since we've been in business, everything that we've done to our environment and every emission, we're going to remove those historical carbon emissions one way or the other, innovation, capturing, other offsetting, whatever methods that they use. And that's where we all need to be thinking. That's how businesses need to think, let's leave the planet better than we found it. And if we do that, we'll have an abundance of resources for many generations. It's very sustainable in the future. And, and to, to get to that regeneration of seven, six, eight uh, generations into the future, but also have the money and resources to continue to pay your employees, produce products that are circular, that are yeah. uh, cradle to cradle in that way of thinking. And so I, I really love that. And since that time, we've seen so many people embrace this re-imperative, which we've talked about regeneration, but it's just part of this re-imperative of reuse, recycle, repurpose, you know, repeat uh, on and on. It's an endless re-imperative and it really goes about how do we live in a closed system our spaceship earth and do it one that that your children my children my grandchildren will enjoy and, and will work for us all these last three questions i have are for my listeners it's kind of a a little uh teaser for them something that can empower them and they can take away from our discussion um, if there was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that had the power to change our life, what would it be your message? I think the first and foremost is to understand your own environmental footprint and what you can do to change that. So I'd say use as many tools as you can to really understand your own behavior, your own impact, and then systematically what you can do to, to mitigate that. And I think the tools are out there now to enable that, it's just a matter of applying them and uh, being very curious and you know, trying to, trying to figure out in your personal life, your professional life, in terms of your home, in terms of your transport, in terms of your food consumption, your energy consumption, where are your biggest impacts and, and what can you do very practically to, to make a difference? What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Again, I think you need to be looking about where, where are the biggest transformational investments that are being made right now in the economy and how can you contribute to that? So for, the, for example, with this digital product passport, really understanding what that would mean and where, I mean, that will be so transformative and that'll create so many business opportunities. How can you, how can you basically support that and, and generate a new business idea around it that contributes to some of these bigger goals we're talking about. And, you know, business idea that contributes to regeneration, sustainability, informing consumers, informing supply chain performance. There are so many opportunities there. Finding one, understanding where it is and driving forward with it would be great. In this uh, 
long life you've lived so far and hopefully much longer, what have you experienced or learned in your professional journeys so far that you would have loved to know from the start? <laughs> I think I touched on this as we opened. It's really all about personal relationships and, and you know, trust building across people. Um, institutions support uh, people. Uh, they provide frameworks and things, you know, things that, like that. But uh, it's all about, you know, relations and, and collaboration between people and uh, sharing, you know, a common vision and, um, yeah, trusting intent and, and tr trying to align what you want to do with uh, planetary change. I, I think when I started in the UN, I, I, I invested a lot in, in frameworks and kind of higher level policies, thinking that if we set the policy right, the practice would follow. And that didn't always happen. Um, there was usually a big lag between policy and practice. And I think the more I've worked in the system, the more I've focused much more on finding the right people, collaborating with them and trying to do great things together. David, thank you for letting us inside of your ideas. It's been a sheer pleasure. You're a plethora of uh, knowledge and wisdom, and I really appreciate all you do and those amazing people you work with. I know it's not just you, but this would be your chance as, uh, to say your last piece if there's anything we didn't get to discuss or you didn't get a mention. Uh, but other than that, I, I'm done with my questioning. And, and like I said, it's just been a sheer pleasure to to get a blick or a view inside of your ideas. Well, thank you very much, Mark. It's been a real pleasure. I think uh, as you as you opened this conversation, you talked about resilience frontiers. Again, I just think that was such an important um, initiative to cross inspire people that want to dream big and work together. And I know you opened the session I attended and I really loved your presentation. It was inspiring. But I think what's really important is that a lot of those connections in, resili in resilience frontiers have materialized into, into concrete collaboration. And that's been great to watch. And I think that was probably the intent of, of or part of the intent of that framework was really just connecting like-minded people, trying to build relationships and seeing what they did together. So I really wanted to thank you for engaging in Resilience Frontiers. I wanted to thank uh, Yusuf Nassaf for kicking it off and everybody that was a part of that process. It's been really inspirational and a real pleasure to work with all of you. So thank you again. You're most welcome. Matter of fact, today, our podcast will air a little bit down the road, but today was the release of Yusuf's podcast that, that we did together. And so he'll be tickled to, to hear your words as well. But today's a, a great day for him to, to and others to listen to a little bit more about Resilience Frontiers and his podcast. David, I really thank you. Uh, please take care of your, your lovely wife and that beautiful family of yours. And I hope we see each other very soon. Thanks, Mark. Thanks again for inviting me on the podcast. Really appreciated yeah. the conversation and I look forward to working with you. Talk to you later. Thanks. Bye-bye.